So uh, today, as I was saying um, earlier, right, this is uh, the third workshop of the Unshackling Freedom Learning Series. Uh, so we kicked off back in February, uh, building from years long work, of course, that folks that including that you'll be hearing from today uh, have been doing for a long time fighting against uh, incarceration, uh, but incarceration in all the forms, right, and fighting for uh, liberation of our folks. And in February, we did an electronic monitoring 101 session where we just tried to like break down the issue, right, and provide uh, some knowledge about what's been happening and trends that we've been uh, learning about. Uh, from there, we had a session in April around strategies and interventions uh, to this mental EM, including examples of how folks who have been directly impacted have been organizing and different scenarios that folks have been, uh, communities have been facing, right, uh, as far as in, and challenges and strategies um, that, that they're thinking about and tactics to use as well. And today, like what we've learned throughout um, these sessions and also like in hearing from a lot from folks uh, in, in the field, right, is uh, that there are um, a lot of challenges as far as the messaging and narratives that are coming up in this issue, right? And so uh, we're going to be learning today from folks who have been organizing um, and, and leading efforts in abolitionist framework as well, right, which we believe is key uh, to reach liberation. Um, and so uh, we are going to continue just a quick review of what we're going to be doing today. Uh, first, uh, we're going to be starting with the panel. Uh, freedom is the alternative, the importance of abolitionist messaging. Uh, we'll have, uh, hopefully, in the panelists will be Jacinta Gonzalez from Mi Gente and James Kilgore from Media Justice. And then we'll have a quick break. Um, Following that, we'll, we'll do a couple of activities, one about identifying um, harmful narratives affecting our community efforts, and then uh, we'll get into some you know, practical recommendations um, of messaging that we can use. And just wanna make sure, okay. And then um, with that, I know we're uh, gonna be transitioning now into the panel, uh, so I, We'll stop sharing my screen uh, so that way we can spotlight our panelists. And now we'll do that. Cool. And so as we do this, um, I'm going to just quickly ask uh, our uh, James and Jacinta um, as you answer the first question to also introduce yourself briefly. Um, and so we're going to have a brief conversation. And then at, at the end, uh, if time permits, there will be time for questions as well from folks who are attending. And again, thank you so much, both of you, for joining us today um, and giving us the opportunity to learn from a lot of your experience and knowledge. Uh, so, you know, one example of an abolitionist demand, including um, effective messaging framework that like, you know, I've been organizing for 10 years and I've always admired uh, this campaign so much, right? The Not One More campaign um, in organizing against deportations. Um, and so I know Jacinta has been a key, all right, for years and part of these efforts. Uh, and I really appreciate, you know, times that I've learned individually from you, right? But I'd love for you to share a little bit about uh, like how did this develop, right? In intervention really, because there have been um, you know, some folks that have focused on just like family, for example, or right, uh, or people that have, you know, I guess like clean backgrounds or whatever, right? Um, so can you tell us about the development of this intervention and what were the impacts of this framing? Um, and also a little bit about like who you felt were the best messengers. Sure. Um, well, first and foremost, hey, everybody, it's good to be in shared space with folks. Um, I'm going to do my best interpreters to go uh, at a reasonable pace, but I tend to get excited. So please, please tell me in the chat if I, if my excitement is getting out of control, tone it down. Um, so to, to first introduce myself, um, Jacinta, she, her, ella pronouns. I'm a, a senior campaign organizer um, with Mi Gente. Um, you know, Mi Gente is a national hub for Chicanx and Latinx organizing, both, you know, on the ground, in the field, and digitally and online. 
Um, and a lot of us come out of the Not One More campaign, right? So we, we have our organizations, but we also have our um, organizing legacies or places where we've been working. And so the Not One More campaign was a national campaign fighting against deportations. Um, and so, you know, I think for folks that might not be that familiar with the immigrant rights movement, um, that's great. <laughs> I wish I wasn't, like you're saying, Danny, 10 plus years um, deep in, in some of this stuff. But, you know, for, for a very long time, the immigrant rights movement has kind of had as its goal, right, um, a pathway to citizenship, comprehensive immigration reform, you know, legalization. It's been called different things at different political moments. But that was always kind of seen as where folks were going. And as part of those political negotiations, you know, it was always a, a, a it, it felt like a political football between Republicans and Democrats. There was talking points. But there's always sort of like this idea, this premise that in order to get policy change, you had to have trade-offs. And some of those trade-offs were, well, if we're going to, you know, give some folks a path to citizenship. That means other folks have to be criminalized and put on a path to deportation. And, you know, as as, as much as Republicans would start to, to up the ante on, on, on their framework and sort of go further and further right, criminalizing people more, providing more, um, you know, far right alternatives to, to immigration, Democrats would, instead of trying to balance that out and, you know, provide something that would actually defend human rights, they would actually try to pretend to be strong ground enforcement. And so that's why we would consistently see a more militarized border. That's why we would consistently see deportations going up and we would consistently see the, the detention machinery, right, build up even stronger, right? Um, and so this kind of came to a head, particularly during the Obama administration, where we were seeing, um, you know, a huge uptick in numbers of deportations. And so a lot of us as organizers were like, why are people doing marches, going to Congress, when really the bleeding point issue in our communities right now is the constant attack of raids, constantly people in our communities being deported and, um, you know, transferred from local jails, local police are working more and more with immigration agents. What can we do to be able to actually go in on this as we're understanding that it's part of a broader fight against criminalization in the United States against communities um, that have been over-policed and over-incarcerated for a very long time. Um, and so I think from, and from that perspective, a lot of us were, were just trying to figure out what to do, you know, and during the Not One More campaign, I actually worked at the Congress of Day Laborers in New Orleans. Shout out to a lot of the, the New Orleans folks that are part of this conversation right now, particularly folks like Wes, who, who we were organizing with um, there in, in Louisiana. And, you know, we were organizing against the deportations of our members. And so little by little, what we were seeing is that there was, you know, ways that people could come together to strengthen their power to be able to fight to stop someone's individual deportation. And we started to talk to our, you know, our folks in, in, in Phoenix, Arizona, right? The folks at Puente, and they were doing the same thing. We we're talking to our folks at Lar in Georgia, and they were doing the same thing. And so basically there was this idea of how do we, we come together with a, a, a big, bold demand around what's happening in our communities. But I want to say that it's 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 interesting now, like how folks, you know, whatever, how how history is rewritten or retold, because I think for us it was both important to have a big bold demand, but it was also really important to be building power at all levels, and that meant power locally, right? So stopping individual deportations, passing local policy, as well as building a national movement that would create momentum to shift what was happening at the federal level. Um, and I think one of the places where it was seen to be doing to be done really successfully was actually within the undocumented youth movement, right, where there was a lot of folks that had, again, been advocating for policy shift um, in Congress, right, the DREAM Act, but there was a shift where folks were like, actually, you can stop deportations, you can provide some sort of protection for folks now from, from the administration directly, and we're able to get DACA. Right. And so there was sort of like a pathway and, and a, a convergence of different movements that sort of led to that. Um, so, you know, who were the most effective messengers were actually the folks that were in the fight directly themselves. It was folks that were fighting their own deportation cases, folks that had been released from detention and were fighting back, family members of folks that were detained or about to be deported. 
um, it was actually those communities that were able to tell the story in the way that was the most powerful and hard hitting and, and let us actually build power and momentum. Thank you so much, Jacinta. Um, and this next question, I'll start off with you, James. Um, and, you know, similar in just the way that the state and the and its private partners do, right? Uh, we've seen how the state and profiteers exploit narratives like, uh, you know, for example, in the immigration context, like the good versus bad immigrant, right? To uh, determine, for example, when somebody will be put behind the physical cage or an electronic cage. Uh, so how do you think these narratives impact um, our efforts to challenge EM and incarceration? And again, if you can introduce yourself briefly, uh, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. And thank you to everyone for being here today and to uh, Media Justice for putting this on. My name is James Kilgore, he, him. Um, I'm a researcher for Media Justice. I've been looking into the issues of electronic monitoring for about 10 years uh, since I was spent a year on electronic monitoring myself. So I think, I think, I mean, one of the things that's, that's happened is that the authorities have tried to criminalize people who are incarcerated in different ways. So one of the differences between electronic monitoring in the criminal legal system and the immigration system is that electronic monitoring in the criminal legal system is completely decentralized. So there's no national authority that sets policy and every locality has a different provider, a different set of rules and it's city councils or county boards, or in some cases, uh, state legislatures that make the rules and, and regulations for that. So there's different ways in which this narrative uh, plays out. But one of the things that has happened is that people who are on electronic monitoring and who might commit a, commit a crime or be arrested, that's used as leverage to further criminalize those people. And to, to imply that these people should not even be out of jail or prison, let alone on an electronic monitor. So it's part of the narrative about keeping people locked up in brick and mortar prisons, and that even an electronic monitor is not harsh enough in order to control these, these people. And so obviously that's not a narrative that we, that we agree with, we don't believe anyone should even be on a monitor. We we favor the abolition of electronic monitors, but we have to sometimes fight sort of rear guard actions against the authorities that try to criminalize people who are on on monitors and make them look as if they're, you know, potential murderers and rapists that need to be back inside cages. Thanks, James. Jacinta, would you like to add to this question? Uh, about how um, the narratives around good versus bad immigrant, for example, and like how that affects our efforts. Yeah, I mean, I think the the good versus bad immigrant, uh, should we call it a paradigm, should we call it a framework, uh, tension, um, has been around and has complicated a lot of things. I think what we also start to see is that the the way that how you define those terms, right, is also constantly shifting, right? At some point it was like, if you have a DUI, then you're definitely a bad immigrant and you definitely have to be, you know, on the fast path for deportation. I think part of the, the effort of, of organizing is to constantly be pushing back on that, right? We're saying no one, but at the same time, we're constantly pushing back to, to, to make that um, limit further and further and further and further out. Um, and so I think that what we've seen in, 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 in current times is that we're there, there's both the, the, the framework of good versus bad immigrant, but there's also the, the having to justify the technology and the surveillance and the criminalization as is, so that now it's not even good versus bad. Now it's just recently arrived, right? Like that's who is the, the new priority or the, the way that they're justifying it. And so I think it's both understanding that there are conversations around safety criminality that are used sometimes to be able to justify using more surveillance, more technology, more you know, detention. But then there's also just 
the system itself trying to justify its own existence and trying to figure out how to do that in, in, in different ways and is constantly shifting. So I feel like sometimes we're like still set on thinking that they're doing it in one particular way, but I think it's important to know how it's constantly shifting and how it's constantly changing. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I mean, with that, right, uh, I also think as like the uh, uh, efforts to expand criminalization are happening, right, um, there are still some ways that the state and the targets they like, try to undermine and even like co-opt some of the progress, right, or like in or efforts to try to like get to progress, you know. Um, and so, for example, um, there have been and like like you were saying like the decision makers and players on this are like city county boards right um states the federal government uh, and they're deciding from uh like local types of incarceration to also like the ice level um and throughout you see these same players who are locking people up also try to co-opt and undermine messaging for example like the alternatives to incarceration right which ultimately now that's what, for example, even like Geo, right? One of the biggest, most violent corporations using these, um, te using this technology, they try to use it now, right? ICE uses this framing, for example, too. Um, so yeah, what what do y'all think we can learn from this of seeing this like co-optation undermining um, of of the messaging that's been happening? Um, yeah, uh, James, you want to go first? Okay, sure. Well, I think. I think we need to be clear that electronic monitoring is a form of incarceration. I don't think we should allow them to call it an alternative to incarceration or incarceration light, or it's just a slap on the wrist, or we only use this on good people who are nonviolent. I think we need to be clear that electronic monitoring, whether regardless of what form it takes, whether it's an ankle shackle, whether it's a wrist shackle, whether it's a, an app on a phone, it's a form of incarceration, it's a form of deprivation of liberty. And we can't allow, we can't allow the authorities to redefine it and make it look like it's a gentle response to, to, uh, to, to crime, but rather that it's part of the continuum of punishment and, and control, which is what this technology is after all. So I think there's another part to this, and that is we need to recognize that these technologies that they're developing are both punitive and they're also they're also bogus technology. They don't work. They don't even do what they say they're they're going to do. So we're promised by the authorities that these devices are going to track people and tell us where they are. But every day, hundreds and hundreds of people are reported being somewhere where they're not because this technology is such is so badly designed and badly tested. So I think we need to contest that idea, the sort of what I call the mythology of technology, that we can solve the problems of crime, criminal justice, housing, et cetera, with technology instead of by mobilizing communities and developing and developing alternatives, that is, genuine options that improve people's access to freedom and improve their conditions of life. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more with, with what James just laid out. I mean, I think that is incredibly true and powerful. Um, I, I, the only thing I would add is, is, is on two fronts. I think one is because there, because it, you know, we we at Mijente launched a campaign called No Tech for ICE, precisely trying to target the tech and data companies that are fueling the detention and deportation machinery. And part of the reason we did that is because we were seeing that it wasn't just big detention companies, right, like CCA and GEO that were profiteering off of ICE's expansion as, a, as an agency. It was also all of these tech and data companies that first saw war as a big investment, right, in terms of growing their, their business. Then saw a militarized border, and now we're like, okay, let's go in with everyone, right? Let's go in with federal immigration police, ICE. Let's go in with local police. Let's figure out, you know, any agency that we can try to do. 
And so then you have, it, it gives you the setup where you actually have two targets. You have the government agencies at all levels, but then you also have the corporations themselves. And so that gives us the kind of dual task, like our job wasn't hard enough, to have to both demand policy, but also fight against corporations that are promoting their own, it's marketing. Right. Like we're, it's not even like it's like a narrative shift. It's like it is straight up marketing. They're lying about their products because they're trying to make money. And so I think we have to kind of both understand that. Right. Understand how we go into that, um, into that conversation. And then the second thing is, I think, you know, our messaging is incredibly important. And I agree with everything that's been said. But I also think we have to have a power analysis. Like, we're not just having a conversation where we're like having fights around words. Like, we actually have to be thinking about what are the strategies to build power to be able to push back on some of these things. And so sometimes I think we're, we're it is important to have abolitionist messaging, 100%. I'm not trying to, to dissuade from that. But I'm also saying we actually have to be thinking about how are we building the power that we need to be able to get there. Because if not, it's like we're having an air war conversation, but they're sending in lobbyists, they're building up infrastructure, they're creating these systems. And so we actually have to be thinking kind of on all of those fronts, which is why this is so hard, right? Like, I, I think that's also something for us to understand. I've heard a lot of folks be very frustrated at like, why is alternatives to detention, whatever, you know, the electronic shackle program growing so much? Like, why is it because of all of these factors? You have big business, you have, you know, the political um, th issues. And then how are we fighting back? How are we actually organizing around it is, is a factor as well. So I just think that those are all kind of components of things that we have to be grappling with as we're trying to build a movement against these, these types of, of things. Awesome. Thank you so much. I also want to just, um, you know, highlight a message in the chat uh, saying uh, that the propaganda they, of like kind of gentlers, they try to make it sound like they're doing people like a favor, right? But in, in that, it's not, right? It's, it's another form of violence. Um, and to what like you were saying right now, Jacinta, um, about like that building that power, right? And I feel like an example of what we've seen about that is like in Illinois, right? Where there's there has been uh, like a lot of building power over years and campaign work uh, and even some progress in, in giving some protections, right, uh, from the harms of EM and, and other, other forms of state violence. Uh, and there has been, at the same time, even with like this limited progress, right, there's of course still like backlash from the haters. And so um, I know, James, you're based in Illinois, so if, if you'd be down to share about like the challenges that you feel like have come up, and I know there have been like some like very direct attacks, um, and then like what's been most effective in like fending off these attacks, and also uh, we're like close to time, um, but if uh, then like it has seemed that you want to add on to it as well, um, so I'll have folks in Chicago too, that'd be great, uh, and just a quick heads up, folks, we're going to skip the break, but you know, if you need to take care of yourselves, please do. Um, uh, but we want to be mindful of, you know, end time as well. Uh, so yeah. James. Thanks, Danny. Well, the, the struggle in Illinois consolidated around the issue of the Pretrial Fairness Act, which was the first law nationwide to ban cash bond or cash bail. And so the backlash against this was really powerful on at least two levels. The first level is just the authorities in particular trying to identify anyone who was on electronic monitor, particularly in Cook County, and it, that committed any kind of offense, taking that to the media, profiling them, and so showing how giving people who are on electronic monitors any kind of movement was going to be a threat to the community. Secondly, they put out, they put out like eight page newspapers called The Sun, and in those newspapers, and these were distributed across the state in hundreds of thousands, put in people's mailboxes, which had pictures of everybody in the local jail, the mugshots of people in the local jail, saying that if the Pretrial Fairness Act were implemented, that all of these people were going to be let out of jail and be roaming through the community committing crimes. It was an incredibly powerful propaganda tool, but I think we fought back effectively be for in, in three ways. The first way was that the whole campaign for the Pretrial Fairness Act 
involve mobilizing a statewide network of people in in all the 102 counties of or most of the 102 counties of Illinois, so that local people were able to mobilize at their at, at the community level to to push back against on the, against this. Secondly, researchers were able to generate statistics to show that it was a minute sliver of people who were on electronic monitoring who ever got whoever got stopped or taken into custody by the by the police that that was not something that was happening with any great volume and then thirdly we used the voices of impacted people people who had been on the monitor people who were who had been kept in in house arrest 24/7 for months or even years on end we used their experiences to help to help convince the public that the the that people deserve to have some kind of movement if they were going to be on an electronic monitor. And obviously we use that as an opportunity to agitate for full freedom and no electronic monitoring at all. Thanks, James. Jacinta? Well, I mean, I, I so much love and admiration for the work that has been um, happening here in Illinois on this front. I mean, just, just a, a reference to the haters, um, I think is just kind of also following what's been happening with CCA and GEO, the two um, private prison companies that own most of the detention infrastructure in the United States, is that they have also gone through their own little rebranding and reshaping, right, to actually focus more on these quote unquote alternatives to detention. Um, and GEO owns the company that runs the ankle shackle program for ICE. Um, and so just to sort of say that like, you know, again, haters gonna hate, they're gonna have their business opportunities, but that also means they set up their business infrastructure to advocate and lobby for these things. So I think it's important to kind of note that as both of like, they do it in messaging, they also do it in lobbying, they do it in interest. Um, we were just trying to pass a, a, a local ordinance in the in Cook County here in Illinois, um, you know, and the data brokers are threatening the, the attorneys that they're going to shut down the notification systems for victims if they do, you know, so you, you're, you're constantly having to also face these types of, of companies that have very deep pockets. So it's not only swaying the politicians that we have, it's fighting against those, those interests. Awesome. Thank you much. Uh, thank you both of you, Jacinta and James. Uh, if folks can, you know, react with some emoji love uh, or drop some love in the chat, that would be really great. Uh, we really appreciate you sharing uh, your knowledge and experience with all of us uh, and really like, you know, definitely some key examples that I feel like we can all learn from uh, as we're organizing against incarceration. Uh, so really appreciate y'all. Um, and now I'm going to transition us over to uh, the homie Ramsha, uh, who is a fellow organizer with MJ and who is going to be doing the next activity, um, facilitating the next activity. So Ramsha, pass it to you. Hey folks, my name is Ramsha Sajid. I'm an organizer with Media Justice. Thanks Danny for the introduction and for organizing today. I'm so excited to be here with y'all. Um, something I wanna talk about with you all, um, is about narratives and as we engage in narratives about electronic monitoring, I wanna pause and remain rooted in the fact that narratives cause real material impacts. Um, EM is unfortunately not separate from a lot of other pro-police propaganda we are faced with in our organizing. Um, our panelists, James and Jacinta, uh, named the ways that narratives related to immigrants, previously incarcerated folks are used to justify surveillance, um, other types of incarceration uh, and uh, detention, um, and a resource that Media Justice has put forth in the last few months is actually uh, related to pro-police narratives and how we can fight back. Um, and so this resource is called Copaganda Clap Back, and it's a resource to fight back against pro-police and incarceration narratives. Um, and so I'm gonna share my screen for a minute while I pull that up. So here it is. Um, and this is, I believe, page 13 of the resource. And uh, we'll have someone put in the chat where you can find this and download it and look through it. 
Um, but we really want to stay rooted in that narrative is about power. It's about material changes. And so when we talk about pro-police narratives or propaganda, as we colloquially say it, um, we really want to stay rooted in the fact that it's narrative and action. So when you see a city budget release in your community, often the narrative in the news is there's too much crime, crime rates are going up. And that's often to justify police budgets in your community. Um, and the action behind that is to buy more policing equipment. It's to renew contracts with large police tech corporations, including you know, BI and electronic monitoring corporations. Um, it's to use high-tech surveillance tools and to further disinvest from public services that we know do keep us safe, like housing and education and healthcare. Um, and so I wanna, I wanna share with y'all an activity that we're hoping to go through. Um, as James mentioned, like in Illinois, incarceration and, and the ways that um, electronic monitoring and the pretrial, the, specifically the Pretrial Fairness Act were under attack um, are an example of the ways that there is a lot of money and investment by nonprofit news, by corporations to push narratives that we use their surveillance technology. Um, when we don't need it. And I think it's important to analyze where those narratives come from. And so um, what I'm gonna have folks do is actually go into this jam board and we're gonna talk a little bit about electronic monitoring narratives. And so we're gonna take about 10 minutes for people to uh, write out what are the talking points of supporters of electronic monitoring, um, who is spreading propaganda about electronic monitoring? So if you can think of, for example, The Sun, a newspaper that James mentioned, um, how does it get spread? Are you seeing pro-EM messaging on social media? Are you seeing it in your local news? What kind of news? Um, and lastly, why do these narratives get spread? Um, Often it's people take attacks at uh, our perceptions of safety in our communities in order to uh, make us want to have these tools in our communities. Um, and so these will be put in the chat, these links, and then we'll give folks about 10 minutes to, to respond and add their post-it notes to this Jamboard. Are there any questions? All right, cool. So I'll give folks a few minutes. Um, and uh, Danny, how much time do we have? How much time should folks be in the Jamboard? Um, I think 10 minutes is fine. Cool, awesome. So we'll meet back here at uh, 57. Yeah, and one quick note also it might be helpful, um, like for for afterward, if you want to add, uh, like in a note of like your city as well, and uh, that could be cool, uh, just to see what trends or narrative challenges are coming up by locality as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Please add in your city um, with your post-it note. Um, so we'll meet back in about nine minutes, y'all. Thank you. Oh, and I see a question in the chat about playing music in the meantime. I think we do have music. Um, Ernesto, could we could we get some tunes playing, please? Thank you. Yeah.
You will not be able to stay home, brother. You will not be able to plug in, turn on, and cop out. You will not be able to lose yourself on SCAG and skip out for beer during commercials because the revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by Xerox and four parts without commercial interruptions. The revolution will not show you pictures of Nixon blowing a bugle and leading the charge by John Mitchell, General Abrams, and Spiro Agnew to eat hog moths confiscated from a Harlem sanctuary. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by the shape of a war theater and will not star Natalie Wood and Steve McQueen or Bullwinkle and Julia. The revolution will not give your mouth sex appeal. The revolution will not get rid of the nub. The revolution will not make you look five pounds thinner because the revolution will not be televised, brother. There will be no pictures of you and Willie May pushing that shopping cart down the block on the dead run or trying to slide that color TV into a stolen ambulance. NBC will not be able to predict the winner at 832 on reports from 29 districts. The revolution will not be televised. <laughs> There will be no pictures of pigs shooting down brothers on the instant replay. There will be no pictures of pigs shooting down brothers on the instant replay. There will be no pictures of Whitney Young being run out of Harlem on the rail with a brand new process. There will be no slow motion or still life of Roy Wilkins strolling through what in a red, black, and green liberation jumpsuit that he has been saving for just the proper occasion. <laughs> Green Acres, Beverly Hill Police, and Hooterville Churches will no longer be so damn relevant, and women will not care if Dick finally got down with Jane on search for tomorrow, because black people will be in the street looking for a brighter day. The revolution will not be televised. There will be no highlights on the 11 o'clock news and pictures of Harry R. Women Liberationist and Jackie Onassis blowing her nose. The theme song will not be written by Jim Webb or Francis Scott Key, nor sung by Glenn Campbell. Tom Jones, Johnny Cash, Engelbert Humperdinck, or the Rare Earth, the revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be right back after a message about a white tornado, white lightning, or white people. You will not have to worry about a dove in your bedroom, the tiger in your tank, or the giant in your toilet bowl. The revolution will not go better with coke. The revolution will not fight germs if they cause bad breath. The revolution will put you in the driver's seat. The revolution will not be televised, will not be televised, will not be televised, will not be televised. The revolution will be no rebirth, brothers. The revolution will be live. A chunky walking through the twilight. I'm on my way home. <laughs> I lived three days ago, but no one seems to know how gone. Miss Webber hates it, it is. Oh, Miss Bill went bad. Might not be such a bad idea if I never, never went home again. <laughs> Stand as far away from me as you can and ask me why. You know, took your rosy beat, close your eyes to watch me die. You keep saying, kick it, quit it, kick it, quit it, God, but did you ever do that? To turn your inside out, so that the world, so that the world can watch you dance. <laughs> Thank you. 
A boy is born in hot down Mississippi, surrounded by four walls that ain't so pretty. His parents give him love and affection to keep him strong and move him in the right direction. Living just enough, just enough for the city. It's far the word. Some days are 14 hours. And you can believe that it barely makes a dollar. His mother goes and scrubs, blows for penny. And you can tell that she hardly makes a penny. They're living just a dollar. She must enough to sing. It's done no pretty and a sturdy show. Long don't let it go stay. And to walk to school, it's got to gather. But clothes on, they are never ever dead. They're living just now. All right. Hey, folks. Welcome back. Um, can you hear me okay? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia, in the chat. Um, I'm going to wait also and make sure our interpreters are on and translators are on. Um, so, yeah, let's talk about what folks wrote down. Um, I'm noticing a lot of really interesting points um, in different in different cities, in different regions. Um, I thought that uh, a, a through line in some of these is that it makes people safer, that electronic monitoring makes everyone safer, that it's more humane, um, that it's better on mental health. Um, than prison. And I'm curious if anyone wants to speak to what they added. I see Beatriz in the chat um, saying that. Chat acaba de decir que. And I see Morgan, uh, you have your hand raised. Yeah, please, please come off mute. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think a lot of it comes to cost. Um, 
when jurisdictions are deciding uh, whether to opt into electronic monitoring or employ it, um, they consider it cheaper for that jurisdiction than um, the cost of actually housing someone. Um, I think that's a pretty common talking point from them. And obviously it most times doesn't consider the cost to the person that's being monitored, uh, both financial and um, every other realm, <laughs> right? But um, yeah, I think uh, awesome. Right, yeah, like e-carceration is so profitable for these corporations and often does not take into account the cost, like mentally and psychologically for people who are on EM as well. That totally makes sense. Um, and then I was curious what folks said. There's a range of answers here of the who, who spreads uh, propaganda about electronic monitoring. Um, I saw, uh, this note here that it's often judges and large nonprofits, um, people who partner with cities and jails, district attorneys. Does anyone want to speak? Whoever wrote this want to speak to that more? Oh, and we have a hand raised. Uh, please come off mute. We'd love to hear from you. Sí. Hola a todos. Uh, soy Beatriz. Hi everyone, I'm Beatriz. I commented on the chat around creating the police, a community police. I think that's a form of um, to show community that they can have control on on how to control on how to criminalize their own community because in that way the police department doesn't have to do the work of teaching us or tell us these are the tools to use, but it's the community itself who's doing it in the ways that they can show each other and the way that they can can do it. And they can, they wanna make us feel that the, the immigrant community are immigrants, especially minorities, uh, fo black folks or Asian folks or Hispanic folks. And it's because of the fear, the fear that exists within the community that people stay hidden. And in that way, when they have that role that their own policing, they, you know, they, they, they say that they, the police says that they want to become friends with the community. They use the community to spread that message. And they say, we want to be friends with y'all. And it's a way to, to psychologically like play with people's minds, play with our community. And when, and when then in that way, we don't even notice. And people are tend to justify because it's, oh, this person deserves it because they did this and that. And then we then we end up criminalizing each other within community. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. There's entire federal programs like See Something, Say Something that dwell on us telling on one another or snitching on one another. And so I really appreciate that often, um, often it's within our own communities that people tell on one another. And um, it's unfortunately just too common. Um, I know we're also up against time. So I'm gonna skip to the last uh, slide around why do false narratives about electronic monitoring get spread? Um, yeah, do folks want to share about why why they added a particular post-it note? Yeah, I see a hand raised. Please let us know your thoughts. Hi, this is Gillen. I'm in Arlington, Virginia, and uh, in the recent sheriff's race um, for the primaries, uh, the incumbent who was unelected, but now he was appointed by the last sheriff, um, his you know big public safety proposal was wristbands on the people that are detained at the Arlington County Detention Facility, uh, where I spent seven years of my life, um, because the uh, there have been seven deaths over the last seven years, uh, and that's the solution instead of actually paying attention to people in cages. Um, so, you know, the, basically that just boils down to 
jailers can't do their jobs, so they're going to outsource it to technology. Oh, I was off mute for a second. Um, yeah, that's so real. It's often like exporting the problem to tech as like the solution. Um, I really appreciate you highlighting that. Um, please y'all look through the slides and see what other regional narratives you're seeing um, across the country, what other folks have shared. Thank you so much y'all for sharing your knowledge here today. Um, we're not done yet, actually. I think uh, we have an amazing facilitator up next. Uh, DJ Hudson, um, our digital organizer here at Media Justice. Um, I'll pass the mic to you. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much. And I'm so, so excited to be here with you all. Um, in part because I literally just realized that uh, one of the stories that I've gotten the privilege to tell and share uh, one of those storytellers is here with us this evening. So let me stop gushing and slow down. Uh, I'm DJ. I use he and they pronouns. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, where Cop City will not ever be built. And uh, I am our digital organizer and on the comms team for Media Justice. Um, it's uh, definitely a, a joy and a pleasure to be here with you all. I'm really grateful for the opportunity and the work that everyone here is doing. And I'm going to share my screen and get into some narrative recommendations from the comms team. All right, let's make this smaller and hit this slideshow. So um, I'll do my best to not go too fast, but I know that we're getting towards the end. I want to leave time for folks to ask questions of everyone and all the things we've heard today. And because a lot of what I'm going to say has been said before, but it definitely is worth repeating. Um, the good news that I have about the narrative strategy recommendations I'm here to share from our comms team to you all is that it really just boils down to telling the truth and to letting people's stories speak for themselves and to tell that truth. Uh, since I've been here at Media Justice, I've learned a lot from uh, working with and amplifying and editing and designing the words and the language that um, organizers and researchers are using to fight back against EM. And in particular, I've learned a lot from James and from Emmett um, about what's most important when we are talking about electronic monitoring out in the world. And one of the first ones is a question that we've started with already earlier today. Um, how do you respond to the question, but isn't EM better than jail? It's a question that, as we've already acknowledged, is actually a Trojan horse for carceral thinking and for more crime and punishment language to make its way into the mainstream. Um, but for everyday people who are having these conversations, it's a question that might come up for folks because that's the conclusion they're being led to, that any form of incarceration could somehow actually be a better form, as we've talked about. Um, I'm going to rely really heavily on resources that um, we, Media Justice, have put out into the world and produced. I've got links here on these slides, and I'll make sure that you all get links to these resources. Uh, because nothing speaks better than people's real lived experience. So uh, as an example of how you answer this question, I'll read a few words from James and from Brian Dolinar in a piece that came out in um, uh, earlier this year, I think it was. <clears throat> Electronic monitoring is not an alternative, not a diversion, not a new way of doing things. Electronic monitoring and the usual regimes of house arrest that accompany tracking technology are another form of incarceration. Proponents may package EM as reform, but its essence remains punishment and control. That's really the essence of how you respond to this question. You reframe what EM is. EM is not, electronic monitoring is not in any way an alternative to incarceration. It's another form of incarceration. James was the one in particular who pointed out this real simple reframing, but it makes a very big difference because the way that electronic monitoring gets shared and talked about in the mainstream obscures a lot of things, including the fact that it is a carceral technology. 
It also extends the reach and the, and the harm of the prison system into our homes, our families, and our communities. And it's a false solution. And it creates harmful conditions that are unique to what happens when you extend the prison system into people's homes using technology. It's important to say that, and it's also really important to be consistent in naming EM always as a form of incarceration. That's one of the easiest ways to combat this. You don't have to argue with people about, is it better? Here's the ways that are better. Sharing facts and figures in better. It just is, and you say that. These are some of the key talking points that we make sure that whenever we're talking about EM out in the world, whether it's a report, an article, an interview, we always include. One, again, EM is not an alternative to the prison system. It's an alternate form of incarceration. And two, EM extends the reach and the harm of the prison system into our homes, our families, and communities. This point is really important to keep bringing up, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the easiest way to keep it bringing up, keep bringing it up, which is telling people stories of real lived experience. Because what happens when you tell the full story of how EM impacts people's lives, then you begin to remind people that when they're talking about a person being tracked by a monitor, you're talking about a person. The picture on the left is the cover for the No More Shackles report, a pretrial report that came out a couple of years ago, one of the first EM pieces I got to work on here. They also are, a, this is also a resource I highly recommend. There's a link here specifically because they are 10 bullet pointed ar arguments that each have their own dedicated chapter. They go deeper into all the reasons why it's important to advance our narrative in this way. But I point out this picture and I include it here because as you can see there, there's a kiddo standing there. When people are talking about all of these big, scary, huge ideas of what's going to happen, the misinformation that is being spread out in the world, or if they're thinking about things like fairness and serving your time, this is carceral logic and this is carceral thinking that keeps people in a track record of a human being somehow deserves to be punished in this way. But what they're not thinking about is that a human being is a person who's a part of a community, who's a part of a family, who was once a kid, who probably has a kid, who probably lives with the kid, who definitely knows a kid. This creates a much bigger, more realistic picture for people that's just simply accurate. And that's why we tell people stories and we center the real lived experiences of the people who are Im impacted by him when we talk about it. So I literally was just in the chat <laughs> um, DMing with Ms. Monica because I realized you're here and I'm so grateful that you're here because your story was one of the first pieces I got to work on. And I'm really grateful for it because this is an exceptional example of what I'm talking about here. And uh, also, as you can see, we've got a video, a screenshot here from our electronic monitoring hotspots map, where we've got a video of you talking and sharing with people, as well as a quote that comes from an entirely different report. The reason why is because in media justice, we include our people's stories as a part of our research and our data, because it is. One of these are some of the recommendations that we have for keeping in mind, but I'm sharing the link here to our hotspots map because I really hope that people will take time to explore it, click on it. You can see what things look like in your area where you live, but you can also hear people's stories in videos and in audio just like this. One, harnessing our stories are powerful. Storytelling centers those who are living with EM, and it tells the truth about the impact of this carceral technology in our homes, our neighborhoods, and our communities. Stories connect fights across the country and shift hearts and minds towards abolition. Also, I'm from the South, and again, and we talk about telling the truth and shaming the devil. Here, the devil is the prison industrial system. When people get to tell their stories, the truth of a thing comes out. And all of these ideas and all of this carceral logic, it can't hold water anymore. We're not talking about convincing people. We're not talking about winning hearts and minds so that we can get to more numbers. We're talking about making sure that people realize that we're talking about people, communities that include you and that reframe the issue in a particular way. And what I mean by that, I'll say a little bit more on the next slide, but how lived experiences reframe the issue for us is that it allows people's stories to speak for themselves. People don't need a mic passed to them. You're not giving a voice to the voiceless. 
all you're doing is ensuring that the full story gets told. And again, because as I said earlier, stories are also data. One of the most unique things and the impacts that our research has is that it makes this clear to people by practicing it. You should be doing that as well in your narrative work. Um, a little bit more about what I mean when I say reframing the issue. These are two bullet points that are actually summaries um, from Beautiful Trouble, Toolbox for Revolution. It's like my organizing Bible. I can't recommend it enough. And these links go to their online toolbox, which is very, very helpful. Highly recommend checking it out. This is not a media justice resource, but it's definitely one I'm really inspired by. But what I mean by letting real lived experience reframe the issue is that one, including reality, also it, it fights the misinformation. There are always going to be real true things that get left out whenever a story that's based on misinfo or disinfo is being spread. You tell a different story by including the details that are missing from the dominant or misinformed narrative. We include our people's stories because we wanna tell a complete one and we wanna make sure that our research and our data is thorough. Also, again, telling the truth and shaming the devil, call EM what it is. It is incarceration. It is surveillance. It is not an alternative, and you don't have to speak to that. By consistently using intentional language like incarceration, you're reminding people that electronic monitoring is not a humane reform. It's not a harmless piece of jewelry when people call it an ankle bracelet. It is a carceral tool, and it should be named as that simply just for the, the sake of accuracy. And then again, it's really important also to make the invisible visible. Because electronic monitoring extends the PIC into our people's homes, storytelling is a really important way for you to show people what the impact of living on an ankle monitor, of living with a device on your phone, of living being tracked by GPS when you go to work, what that actually looks like on the day to day. When people are just reading about something in the news or hearing about it, what you're hearing is a lot of the same fear mongering that I saw coming out of that jam board that we're all seeing in our communities across the country right now. You cut through that by allowing the real things to shine through, which are people's stories. Learning what life is like on a monitor directly from the people living it makes it clear that you are not serving your time from the comfort of your own home, that that is a ridiculous idea. There is no comfort, no safety, no convenience in having the prison system in your home, around your family, and in your community. That becomes abundantly clear when you've got somebody's story right here telling you what's going on. And then these are my resources. Um, I, I wanted to keep it brief just because I really want these things to speak for themselves. On the left here, I've got a list of some of the reports that we've put out recently. And again, I will highlight the Electronic Hotspots Map website. Um, one of the things that we've been doing this year are adding case studies, which go even deeper into how EM has been spreading and developing in different local communities. And we're continuing to update that all the time. But there are so many stories that are there that you totally should use, you should totally watch, you should share, share them with people. Um, and yeah, um, just always remember that the truth is going to be the most important thing to reach people because then the truth is our relationships, our human relationships to each other. And even a prison system can't stand up to that. Um, I am actually going to close my slides here and stop sharing my screen. Um, uh, but I, I wanted to see, I don't know if there's time, um, at all. Danny, I'm not sure if uh, Ms. Monica, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you feel comfortable sharing a little bit, whether in the chat or if you wanted to come off mute for a moment and share about what it was like for you getting to tell your story and share your story in this context, that'd be awesome. I'm just really grateful to you for what you do. But with that, I'll stop talking. DJ, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, being able to talk about it for one just is kind of liberating in itself because I think that when we're able to speak for ourselves, it lets everybody else know, one, you said this earlier, you're not giving a voice to a voice to the voices, like we have one, you just pass in the mic, right? And I, I think that's super duper important. As for being on EM, I think it turns 
your house into a satellite of the jail, of the prison, right? Um, it gives them, like, for real, they got a 24-hour fucking warrant, just access to your crib and everything in it, um, and everyone in it. And so it functions like it replicates domestic violence, state violence and domestic violence replicate each other in the way they function and like how they do shit, right? So that's like the DV comparison would be stalking and surveillance, right? And so that's not just of the person on EM, that's everybody around. And so that also functions as like in domestic violence, when it isolates someone, it does the same thing. Because like real talk, people don't, it's hard for people to even be on EM because everybody who's hosting someone on EM knows what it is. And so a lot of people don't want to be bothered because that constant police presence, right? So it's isolating. And also like, it's hard to organize. So it also functions as a counterinsurgency. You know what I'm saying? Um, that's what I got. And everybody, Danny, James, DJ, like everybody on this call, thank you for all that you're doing. Shit, I love this. We're gonna kick some ass and for real Cop City will never be built. I'm so glad you down there. Fuck yeah, man. Excuse me, excuse my French. Um, yeah, I thank you so much again. And and the, I just will just leave y'all with that. Um, you you can't get better data than our people's stories and our real lived experiences. And it's also just important to call it what it is. Every single opportunity that you get, as you do that, you start actually making a difference and really shifting the logic that is the mainstream narrative that people are hearing every day. And last thing, practice. Talk to your family members, talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends. Doesn't the, All of this doesn't have to just be for reporters. Your narrative is your narrative. Share it wherever, because it's true. And that's it for me. Thank you, y'all. Ooh, thank you so much, DJ, and thank you, Monica, uh, for sharing as well. Um, so we are almost at time. We are, we did catch up, though. Um, so if there are any questions that folks have, um, we have a couple of minutes, and I know that there have been some comments in the chat, uh, but yeah, is there anyone that would like to add a question, either for DJ or also um, I believe like James is still on. Uh, so uh, if, yeah, if anything y'all wanted to add or anything like that. Oh, thank you. Um, I see a, there is a question. Um, uh, let me read it out loud. So in a way, can we say that electronic monitoring is proof that we don't need prison or EM for the vast majority of cases. Uh, so yeah, James, are you, would you be done to take this one? Okay, um, could you repeat it? Sorry. Yeah, um, so the question is, in a way, can we say that electronic monitoring is proof that we don't need prison nor EM for the vast majority of cases? Yeah, I mean, it's all, I mean, it's all about punishment and control and whether or not we build a, a building and build a cage to put people in or whether we create them with technology. Um, none of it, none of it helps build community. None of it helps improve the lives of the people who are either incarcerated or being tracked on these devices. So I think we need to break free of the ideological cage of thinking about punishment and control and reimagine what we could create in communities without that kind of technology and using the resources that go into building jails, prisons, and into carceral technology to meet the needs of communities and build peaceful spaces. Thanks, James. Oh, and I'll also add um, something reflecting from the previous workshop we had, actually, um, and also uh, I believe maybe Dawn is on, uh, who like shared also about her experience. And like 
uh, also James brought it up earlier as like one of the key points in like in success in fending off the attacks in Illinois is that vast, vast, vast majority of people are, if they have communities, family support, jobs, health, you know, home housing, um, people are, are, we're good, you know, like that's what we got to figure out. How do we build that, build that up? And yeah, we don't need a punishment system, right? We don't need incarceration. We don't need prisons. Uh, what we need is uh, making sure that people can have what they need to live, thrive, right? And the communities that are actually, um, you know, building us together. Uh, one more question is, is it effective narrative building to name it as incarceration instead of another form of incarceration? So much narrative war is on the constant use of buzzwords and I wonder if calling it electronic incarceration is a good strategy in the narrative battle. Um, I think this is, this is gonna be a, a plug for James's work, uh, you know, understanding incarceration. Uh, if folks haven't checked that uh, book out, please do. Um, but yeah, I, you know, James, if you want to say something real quick, uh, please do. We, we call it incarceration. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I, and I don't, uh, I don't think we need to be wedded to a term, but we need to make sure that what we're talking about is not labeling it as something humane, something helpful that we're, that we're na naming it as a form of incarceration, a form of imprisonment. That, in, that makes use of technology. But I don't wanna have a debate about whether we call it e-carceration, electronic incarceration, or plain old incarceration. Let's just make sure that we're calling it what it is. Yeah, um, and I'm, I'll just drop the link also to the book I mentioned. Uh, and then also uh, reality is that it's like building a strategy, right? Against all of it, as I seen that mentioned earlier, is really the key part of it. Uh, and that's what this project is really about and shacking freedom, building and supporting ongoing campaigns already, right? That like, like folks here who have been sharing have been organizing against this type of violence for a long time. Um, and so of course we, we're building on that. Uh, folks who are on this call and, and others who may be you know, catching up later uh, are interested in launching campaigns against them in your communities. Uh, we're definitely, uh, around to support and would love to learn more. Um, so with that, I now uh, transition us into our closing. Um, so first, uh, thank you so much to everyone uh, who's shared today. Um, and thank you everyone who's attended uh, to Jacinta, James, Rumsha, DJ, um, also folks who have been uh, interpreting ASL, uh, in Spanish, English, and uh, uh, today, like I said, is part three of this learning series. It's a, it was a three workshop series. Uh, so we're really grateful to everyone who's helped uh, us put to put these together, including the Unshackling Freedom uh, Squad, a group of organizations and folks who have been doing this work for a long time that are helping uh, to share their expertise um, and analysis right with the field uh, to build up this work. Um, and yeah, uh, as I mentioned, this is about organizing, building power. And so we want to know what you think. Uh, we want uh, you want to get involved and build together. Um, and so, for example, if you'd be interested in hosting a local workshop, right, or uh, if you're like doing some strategy or planning around uh, what organizing against EM in your community looks like, uh, let's link up, right? Um, and we'll also be uh, sharing some follow-up materials. Um, for example, all the links that were mentioned today um, are in a resource guide that we have uh, that has been updated throughout the workshops. And so we'll also be dropping that in the chat. I think it's been dropped a couple of times, uh, but the, you know, it's a one stop, like all the resources are going to be available there. Um, and then also uh, we're going to, we have a, a survey uh, that we are going to be I'm sharing with folks as well to get your feedback. Uh, and just to do a quick screen share again. Um, let's see. Uh, so uh, just one more thing too, is that if folks are interested um, in supporting, right, we uh, appreciate everyone's, you know, joining this series. 
uh, we are also uh, able to keep this type of work going through uh, donations. And so if you'd like to support our work uh, to keep doing political education like this, uh, you can make donations through this. And, and we'll also drop the link in the chat. Um, and then also, uh, if you have questions, this is my email, dan at mediajustice.org, uh, and I'm happy to follow up. Um, but otherwise, I think we're all set, right? So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I'm really grateful to everyone who's made this happen, for all of you for joining us. A good one.